let's introduce item 330, please. Item 330 is Black Lives Experiencing Homelessness Matter, a critical conceptual framework for understanding how policing drives system avoidance among vulnerable populations. Thank you so much. Um, if I could ask our presenters to introduce yourselves for the record and uh, let us know how much time you'd like for your presentation. Wonderful. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Welsh Carroll. I am an associate professor of criminal justice and public administration at San Diego State University. My name is Sean Flanagan. I'm a professor of public administration at San Diego State University. And what was the other question? How much time we would like? About 20 minutes, please. Wonderful. Good afternoon, council and members of the public. We are grateful to have this opportunity to present our research here to you today. We would especially like to thank the council president and his staff for the invitation to speak. In this presentation, we will share findings from a study we conducted during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the spring of 2020, we received a small grant to conduct emergency research to understand how people experiencing homelessness in San Diego were staying safe, healthy, and meeting basic needs while unhoused during a public health crisis. Our research design allowed us to have strong representation from black San Diegans, whose voices are often underrepresented despite high rates of homelessness nationally and here in San Diego. Black San Diegans comprise about 4.7% of our general population, but in official counts, they comprise a quarter of all people experiencing homelessness here. The unhoused San Diegans who participated in our research reported high rates of police contact, frequent lack of respect, overt racism, sexism, and homophobia, and a failure to offer basic services during these encounters with police. When people experiencing extreme poverty face apathy, disrespect, and discrimination from the police, as our data show, the result is a reluctance to seek services and to avoid outreach when offered. This can reinforce stereotypes of unhoused people as not wanting help or as choosing to be homeless. Further, many unhoused people who have had repeated negative interactions with police feel they have no logical reason to expect different treatment from other government service providers. This is deeply concerning when we are urgently trying to get people into housing and linked up with other services that can support that effort. We believe that our community has the tools and information to make this right and to increase the quality of life of San Diegans of all housing statuses. We will lay out our data for you and then discuss what we see as the policy implications and recommendations that bear out from these findings. I will now turn it to my colleague, Sean, to share a little bit about how we completed our study. Next slide, please. So this study took place during the summer of 2020 in the period immediately following the first stay-at-home order at the onset of the COVID pandemic. Um, you may notice from our study title and our study funder that this was not a study of policing or of race. This was actually a health study. Our study title is Service Utilization and Survival Strategies of People Experiencing Unsheltered Homelessness During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And you'll notice our funder was the University of California Tobacco-Related Disease Research, Research Program emergency funding for COVID-19. So this study was not intended to be a study of policing. It was not intended to be a study related to race. Our findings, however, um, pointed so strongly to issues of policing and issues of race that we felt compelled among the several papers that we are producing out of this data to write a paper related to racial issues in policing. Um, the reason that we ask questions about policing in this study, which asks a number of questions about 
service access, um, COVID mitigation strategies, other kinds of survival strategies during the COVID-19 pandemic is because in San Diego, as in other cities, police officers, of course, are a, prim a primary form of outreach to people experiencing homelessness. So this is a reason that our survey data did include questions about policing in spite of the study not being a policing study. Next slide, please. So to speak to our methodology, our driving question in this study was how people are staying safe, healthy, and meeting their basic needs while unsheltered during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our targeted population was unsheltered San Diegans, especially people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, when you're working with this population, this is a very vulnerable and difficult to re reach population. It is not best practice, even in non-COVID times, to just go out on the street and ask the random person that you run into if you can conduct a survey with them. Um, if you want to be able to collect good, high-quality data with this population, you always want to work with trusted partners, and that's what we did. We have a lot of really great partners in the nonprofit community, in the health and human services community that helped us reach out to this population. Um, we usually do, Dr. Welsh and I, human subjects research, and we usually interact with folks face to face. Of course, this is something that we couldn't do during this time period, not only for our own health, but more importantly for the health of people experiencing homelessness, who we know are much more vulnerable than the average individual to um, diseases like COVID-19 because of their health vulnerabilities. So for that reason, we needed to use remote technologies to collect our data. So we used a Qualtrics survey. Most of you have probably taken a Qualtrics survey. Our council members probably have your staffers sending out Qualtrics or Qualtrics-like surveys to your constituents to collect feedback. So those are the kinds of surveys that you might receive via email or via text messages on your phone if you have a smartphone. Um, many folks are not aware that many people experiencing homelessness do have access to phones, although theft of phones and loss of phones can be a common problem. Um, during COVID, we were not sure how many folks would have access to internet, but usually through libraries, Starbucks, coffee shops, people do have access to internet. We were concerned about that access during the COVID-19 pandemic, so we also used another tool called Textit, which can do text message surveys for people who don't have any kind of internet access. So we were able to collect survey data from 244 people who were unhoused. Um, as part of that process, we asked as a final question if people would like to take part in a follow-up interview, a more in-depth interview process, and we were able to conduct those interviews with 57 individuals and collect more in-depth data through that process. Next slide. So you'll see here our respondent demographics. What you'll find with most of our demographics in terms of gender and race and veteran status is that this pretty closely maps on to the, um, the typical demographics of previous studies with people experiencing homelessness in San Diego and demographics of other populations um, from, the, for example, the regional point in time count that happens every year. The thing that's unique about our sample that makes our sample very special is that we were able to substantially oversample from black San Diegans experiencing homelessness. And the reason that this is important is because although black San Diegans account for 4.7% of the general population, they make up about 21% of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness and 30% of San Diegans staying in emergency shelters. So this is a group that is overrepresented in the homeless population, but traditionally has been very, very difficult to get accurate data about their experiences experiencing homelessness. In our research design, almost 46% of our survey respondents are black respondents, and 31.6% of our interview sample were black respondents. So for that reason, we have a really unique data set nationally, but also locally, to be able to speak to the experience of this very important group of individuals. Next slide. To start to speak to some of our findings, um, it's important to keep in mind that pe people experiencing homelessness experience barriers to receiving services from all providers. And we actually have decades of research 
not just from us, but from many other folks that shows that this is the case for many people in low-income populations. And there are a number of different types of barriers. One are administrative barriers, so things like lack of insurance, lack of knowing where to go to receive certain types of services, um, difficulty maintaining appointments, keeping appointments, difficulties with transportation, many of the things that we're very familiar with in terms of the things that make it challenging to receive services when you're someone who is lower income and facing those challenges. There are also a lot of psychological costs to receiving services, and these are particularly augmented among our, ex our population of people experiencing homelessness. So if you think about things like lack of cleanliness, lack of privacy being in a shelter environment, things like being separated from your loved ones or your pets when you're being asked to move into a shelter where you may not be able to stay with your partner, things like having your belongings taken away from you during a street, sheet, a street sweep, being constantly moved from place to place to place. These are really strong experiences of, of psychological trauma that we know that people experiencing homelessness and other people seeking services experience. Racism, sexism, homophobia are other types of psychological costs that people experiencing homelessness experience. And this was very evident in our data. And we find that these barriers are exacerbated strongly by a fear of police profiling and a fear of criminalization of normal survival strategies on the street. And we have some examples here in our quotes. It's quite common, um, one of the most common experiences of policing is you know, staying in your car as a last resort as a housing option and having folks ticket and tow and remove your car and then knowing you're now going to be unsheltered and sleeping on the street because your car has been towed. And so we have a few quotes that speak to that here. Next slide. Great, and on the next slide, um, we're really trying to break down here and visualize what folks told us about their interactions with the police. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see that fully 80% of the folks that we surveyed had had police contact within the most recent three months. Of those, only 13% reported being offered services, and zero of our black participants reported being offered services by the police. More often, the experiences folks shared with us of encounters with the police involved being told to move, having the vehicle in which they live towed, or being ticketed or even arrested. As one participant put it, if you consider tickets a resource, then the police have done that. These reports, it's important to point out, are in direct contradiction to official SDPD Neighborhood Police Division policy, which purports to use a progressive enforcement model that is quote unquote compassionate yet firm. The SDPD claims that officers are trained to always offer services prior to taking enforcement action, and we do not see that bear out in the data that we're presenting to you here today. People were pretty open with us about what they see as how the police view them. Um, one person told us, I am a lifeless, black, unimportant soul to them. Another person told us, as long as the color of my skin is black and as long as I am poor, they will never respect me. Another participant told us, just a few weeks ago, I was in the streets and they shouted, blue lives matter. I was with a couple of black friends in the park. When we responded, black lives matter, they stopped and checked our IDs. We have no criminal records. Next slide, please. People avoid services in part because they are offered by the police. Another concerning piece of this is that their negative perceptions can spill over to other service providers. Black study participants and the other folks we spoke to of color reported a higher volume of interactions with police across the board, as you can see in the line graph, in the bar graph to the left. The black people we spoke with in particular described trying to avoid police at all costs. Another person told us they know they can overpower us 
so they really don't care or respect us. Best interaction is no interaction. White participants showed an awareness of their privilege vis-a-vis -vis black folks experiencing homelessness. As one white participant in our study told us, I've seen a full spectrum of police. I'm fortunate, I'm going to admit, I'm a petite little white girl, I witness a very different dynamic. Next slide, please. So we must ask ourselves, what are the ethical implications of asking our most vulnerable residents to seek services from individuals and agencies that they often perceive as perpetrators of harm, particularly if it makes it less likely for people to accept any services at all. The voices of our study participants speak to the need to create a, pub a system of public safety that supports and cares for rather than punishes unhoused folks in our community. In our view, this will make everyone safer. So when we step back and think about the implications of the data that we have shared with you, there are a few common sense ways we can improve conditions for everyone, especially those experiencing housing depriv deprivation. First, we advocate a do no harm approach. Excessive negative encounters with police produce distrust, reluctance, and outright avoidance of public systems. Anti-homeless policing creates a context in which homeless individuals have frequent police interactions that cause material and emotional harm and do not result in folks getting connected with the services that they need. This in turn drives stereotypes that people don't want help when in fact, if folks had had a history of positive encounters with these systems, they might eagerly embrace the help offered to them. Next, we advocate Decriminalization. Quality of life municipal codes are punishing the life-sustaining behaviors of unhoused people and they do little to prevent or solve crime. As our data show, it does not lead to people being offered services and it generates unnecessary, unnecessary criminal legal contact that can actually prevent folks from getting into housing. We know the impact of a criminal record on accessing housing. Rescission. We advocate for the removal of all homeless outreach efforts and responsibilities from the police department and their officers. Across the U.S. The San and in San Diego, the standard response to homelessness positions police as often the first and only responders to homelessness. Despite admissions from law enforcement that they are not equipped to address many of the underlying causes of homelessness. Given the pervasive lack of trust in the unhoused community and the long and still unaddressed history of violence, especially of police agencies toward black people, it is time for the work of homeless outreach to be taken up exclusively by non-police trained professionals. Reallocation. We should reallocate funding and responsibility for addressing homelessness to trained professionals and to make sure that these organizations center the perspectives of people of color from top to bottom and throughout homeless serving systems. Here we'd like to give a shout out to the RTFH Action Plan on addressing homelessness among black San Diegans, which highlights numerous important steps that we can take to build a more equitable homeless serving system, such as the practice of inclusive procurement to ensure that the staff of our homeless serving agencies look like and have shared experiences with the folks that they are serving. Currently, the action plan cites that less than 11% of frontline staff working in homeless services organizations are black. We need to see that change. Lastly, we advocate for the city to address basic needs. We commend the action plan for acknowledging the urgent need to bolster basic public services. 
the authors of the action plan state the general mantra from most homeless systems is that they are focused on creating permanent solutions to homelessness. The unintended consequence of this generally good policy priority is an often underfunding of basic survival needs, such as access to water, toilets, and trash. We must expand access to these literally life-saving facilities. Next slide, please. So we're going to leave you with some concrete examples of how you can act on this research. What does this look like in practice? Well, one pending piece of legislation here locally offers a common sense approach to this doing no harm component that we advocate. The preventing over policing through equitable community treatment ordinance or protect will eliminate pretext stops that disproportionately affect unhoused people and many other groups. These stops break trust in the legitimacy of law enforcement and do not have meaningful crime control value. Other cities are enacting these kinds of meaningful reforms, such as Philadelphia, and San Diego is well positioned to be a national leader on this issue. A number of municipalities are also putting homelessness outreach and crisis response into non-police hands with great success. Albuquerque, New Mexico, and San Jose, California are two cities we would recommend the city council look at for promising practices around non-police crisis response, ranging from using teams of behavioral health professionals to peer-to-peer -peer responders. There are a lot of ways to think creatively about bolstering our crisis response system. And lastly, we encourage the city council to address basic needs and to improve the quality of life for all San Diegans, regardless of housing status. There are a number of concrete ways we can do this and have real life positive impacts in our neighborhoods. For example, trash collection from encampments means cleaner neighborhoods. The city of San, a city of San Jose is doing this right now. They are offering trash service to encampments. Sonoma County, California is also doing this. In Portland, Oregon, we have public restrooms being provided and attended by folks experiencing homelessness as a workforce development opportunity. This is a time to think creatively about new solutions to very old problems. In closing, I want to mention that my San Diego State colleagues and I were here, standing here before you seven years ago. We were presenting results of one of the many studies of SDPD behavior that have shown the same results. Our findings, which included clear evidence of racial bias in SDPD practices related to traffic stops, weren't taken seriously by the council back then. Our report on these traffic stops, which the city paid for, was shelved with no action taken. While we were standing here presenting this work, our now mayor at the time made an insensitive racial joke about our study design and gave us the rapid up sign when he had heard enough. Our then police chief, when asked to respond to our findings, could only repeatedly reply that every human being has bias until the audience broke out in nervous laughter. Racial bias in policing is no laughing matter. We urge this council to do better, to take leadership on this issue, and to push for the common sense changes that our data suggest starting with PROTECT. Thank you so much for your time and for the opportunity to speak here today. We very much look forward to the discussion and any questions you might have. Uh, thank you to our presenters. Uh, Interim Clerk, do we have any public comment on this item? Yes, we do. Uh, we will start with Michael McConnell, 
and then go to John Brady and Sandra Mostowski, if you guys can please come up to the front row and be ready to speak. Hi, I'm Michael McConnell. I'm wow, sorry, Mike. Pardon? We will be doing one and a half minutes. Let me just set the clock really quick. Please begin, sir. Hi, I'm Michael McConnell. Thank you so much to the authors of this study. Unfortunately, it's what we on the ground witness constantly. It's no surprise. Shouldn't really be a surprise to you. Like they said, seven years ago, uh, brought the same information. Uh, other people have brought the same information in various ways, yet we still do the same thing over and over. One of the things that unhoused folks tell me all the time is, Michael, when you show up, the police treat us so much better. I can only imagine how the police are treating people when a housed person isn't there filming and documenting what they do. I can only imagine. Because they treat people like shit when I'm there. So it's no surprise. Um, I mean, we could go on and on about this topic, and I've, many of you have already heard me speak exhaustively about this over the years, about how criminalizing homelessness does nothing but perpetuate it, yet we still do it. And Council Member Whitburn is currently moving forward another law to further criminalize homelessness, probably out of desperation to get reelected since he's done almost nothing in two years on this issue. I would also like to understand how all of this information and how the increase in homelessness and how we treat homeless people is fitting into this grand proclamation of housing as a human right. Maybe Council President Elo Rivera can enlighten us on how this fits into that grand proclamation. Let's for once act on some of this information. I know y'all aren't big Thank on you. experts and research, but there's always the first Sir, time. Sir, your time has expired. Thank you very much. Next we have John Brady, who has time seated by Matthew Kearney. You'll have three minutes, Mr. Brady. That was hard. So let's paint a picture. Our black neighbors are statistically more likely to be engaged by police. They are far more likely to be ticketed, arrested, and incarcerated for violations that others would not be. They are returned from incarceration back to our streets. Subsequently, they are underserved by providers and over-policed by failed policy that this city continues to support. Namely, supporting the traumatizing sweeps that are now being referred to casually as abatements. Potato, potato, it's the same thing. I urge you to watch the recently released video on YouTube of Dr. Brett Feldman, Director of Street Medicine Outreach in Los Angeles, which identifies the many types of damage being done by the same practices that we are using in San Diego. And now we are continuing to kill people by dooming them to failure. Over the past months, we have been looking into justice-involved reentry here in San Diego. Working with the reentry liaison in the San Diego County DA's office, we put in a request for the numbers released from prison after 10 years and the numbers released from jail after 90 days, assuming it is likely that they had lost their housing and or jobs. The numbers are substantial, 402 people a month from our jails and 163 from prison are released every month into the city of San Diego and I guarantee you at least half of them end up on our streets because we have no alternatives. That's 6,780 people a year. Assuming that half of the number are ending up on our streets, that's half of our point in time count population. Think about that. Conservatively, we estimate that uh, the data in, in last year's AB 328 bill makes it clear that 70% of those people that receive housing do not recidivate. Our current practices are failing the black and brown community and the homeless community at large. Finally, I hope this makes you think about the many times you've heard homeless people described as service resistant. The results of this data should make you question the reliability of anyone who uses this excuse to deflect blame on what is a wholly inadequate and discriminatory services and solutions operation here in the city and largely across the country. There's a reason that we supported and presented a shelter bill of rights months ago, and there's a reason that it has not been implemented. 
it makes me cry. It's hard. You've all seen this data before. We are failing this population, and we are failing those that have been discriminated against by decades of suppression. Thank you. Our next speakers are going to be Sandra Masowski, Janice Wilds, Colleen Cusack, and Danny. If you can please come up to the front row, and then Ms. Cusack, you will have a minute and a half. Please begin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for letting me be here to speak with you on behalf of the homeless San Diegans and especially the black and Latino and uh, marginalized population San Diegans who cannot be here today. Uh, criminalizing the homeless is wrong. It's just wrong. While I lived homeless here in San Diego for uh, just under four years, I was criminalized multiple times. Um, I was criminalized just uh, almost four years ago now after I had packed up my belongings in my car and left the Dreams for, Ch Sa Dreams for Change safe parking program at 6 a.m. as we were required to do, and I went and parked over at Rob Field in Ocean Beach in order to participate in an outreach group that I worked with there. Um, I had been parked there for maybe half an hour under my car cover with my service dog, and police came up to me and pulled up my car cover before even announcing who they were and what they were there for. I explained to them that I had just left the safe parking lot, and I was waiting to meet up with the outreach group that I worked with in a few hours, and they did not care. They gave me a ticket anyways. Um, I was already utilizing all of the services that I had access to as a homeless individual, they had no services that they could offer me. If they logged me as refusing services, it would be a blatant lie. They criminalized me. Six months later, I was criminalized again when my car was towed after I'd already paid off all of my parking tickets and my outdated registration. I was called a liar, and Ms. my car was towed, and I'm still recovering from that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Janice Wilds? I keep hoping I'm going to come back here with some good news, that it's gotten better, that you guys have finally taken a stand and said the criminalization is morally wrong and it's a waste of taxpayer money. We can do better. Sadly, I'm back in the same t-shirt with the same message and the same glazed over looks. Come on. You have heard this from experts. This is an excellent study with fabulous recommendations. You should be implementing all of them. It should be a rush to implement them. Today, I was down on 16th doing my relief. I've got a woman who's 57 with lupus, needs help, had her ID and everything stolen in a sweep on Friday that was not posted. They came at 8.30 and said, we're doing a sweep, but they didn't come back till 3.30. This is kind of the new thing, is that the sweeps don't happen right away, so they catch people you know, unawares, and then all their stuff is thrown away. I've got a woman who's got severe schizophrenia. She needs to see a psychiatrist and get her meds and get into a shelter. I'm talking with Levi at the shelter at the library, trying to get her a bed. She wants a bed. She wants in a shelter. She's been asking her caseworker at PATH to help her. Her caseworker is overwhelmed. Okay? This, the people are out there. They want help. They ask me for help all the time. I am on the phone for hours trying to find help for them. In the meantime, the police are rolling up and making their lives harder. This has to change. Thank and you. you guys have to do it. Thank you. Colleen Cusack? Members of council, my name is Colleen Cusack. I'm an attorney, a criminal defense attorney. I'm presently in court on behalf of my homeless client, who I'm representing pro bono, and we are seeking a dismissal of all charges, on the encroachment charges, on the basis that the charges are cruel and unusual, that they violate due process, and that they violate equal protection. And we are proving in court what the experts from San Diego State testified to you, that the San Diego Police Department is engaged in discriminatory practices, targeting homeless people because they're homeless, and targeting homeless people because they're black. So you have this kettling where people experiencing racism end up homeless because of the racism they experience. And then San Diego, city takes $20 million to set up the neighboring police division 
whose purpose is to protect housed people from having to look at unhoused people. You are not helping, and the people perhaps they think when they re report to get it done, they're helping, but they, there isn't help. There aren't adequate shelters. The shelters that exist are unsafe. There aren't adequate housing to get people in. People already have received and are accepted services while they're being arrested by police because they're not going to shelters that don't exist. You have the power to stop this. Don't leave it to the judge, the judge in San Diego Superior Court who said she wants to stay in her lane. Ma'am, your time has it's expired. It's your job as the legislature to take this action. Thank you. Next is Danny. Good evening, council members. It's nice to see everyone here today. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank SDSU and the professors at SDSU for doing this study, and not only doing the study, but adjusting the study to make it uh, what it is right now. Um, I am a undergraduate who is studying leadership development, and I can tell you right now, we have a serious, serious problem with leadership on this council. We have not seen any action from this council in terms of what is happening right now in the streets. I live across the street from the new library that you guys are putting uh, this new shelter in. There are so many people in and out every day, so many people crying, suffering, because we're not doing our job. And I wanna say to you guys, I implore you guys to ensure that the PROTECT Act gets passed immediately. This should have been on the agenda today. Um, we need to do a better job of leading the city. As they, they've already said, we've presented so many times, so many studies, San Diego State is not being valued here. Um, we're doing so many study after study, and yet nothing has happened yet. So I urge you guys to please try to do something with this um, and implement um, the PROTECT Act. As the president of the Downtown Democratic Club, I uh, officially register my support for the PROTECT Act. Um, please do your jobs. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. That does conclude public comment in chambers. I will start the five-minute timer when it pings. No other speakers will be taken. If we can start with um, Ms. Joyce Senyata, star star six. Thank you, Joy Senyata, District 3. We all bleed red. We all bleed red. I say these words because as I do my work of outreach and engagement with the homeless population, often black homeless, I find that we all have the same platform for our stories. And that is because we are all human. As I have deepened and, and go peel the onion more to get into the core of this, I have been stunned to find that the same issues against the homeless are often the same issues that they use against themselves and against their homeless peers, i.e. lack of respect, crime, sexism, and so forth. The only way I stay involved is to come from a man, a mindset of love, for we are all in this together. We are each flawed, biased, and wounded human beings. Therein lies the opportunity to change our mindset. Love to the homeless, love to the police, and love to all of you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Senora. Next, we'll be going to uh, Francine Maxwell. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Okay, sorry. My thing said no. Francine Maxwell, Southeastern San Diego resident. Thank you so much for the report. And it was labeled Black Lives Experiencing. So every time somebody says black and brown, you disrespect the trauma that black people feel in the city of San Diego. Um, so let's start there. On September 19th of 2022, Lisa Jones said that she has to be held accountable for the challenges for SDHC for the con being the contract administrator. Over 500 black people cannot access shelters because of the DNR. Five to one is racial inequity. So 
I thank you, San Diego State, for another report that will go on the shelf. You don't have the bold leadership that you need on the diocese to enact that report. So we thank you once again for the work that was done that will be shelved. Um, the trauma, the inequity, the racial battle fatigue that our unsheltered people feel. Five to one, let that sink in. And go back and play the uh, September 19, 22 uh, city council meeting because if you didn't act September 22 after that meeting, there's nothing to say that you're gonna do anything today with this. Collectively deal with the trauma of racism in San Diego. You're not bold enough yet, but we're still praying for you. Thank you for your comments. Next is Julie Hendricks. Hi, my name is Julie Hendricks. I'm a member of Del Cerro for Black Lives Matter and resident of District 7. Um, I just want to sincerely thank Dr. Flanagan and Dr. Wolf for their valuable research, um, just providing data that shows the unique challenges unsheltered and particularly black unsheltered neighbors face in our city at the hands of our police and our own local government. Um, and once again, showing evidence of racial bias, bias in policing in San Diego. So I echo previous speakers and urging council members to listen, take actual steps to decriminalize homelessness, and then prioritize some of the real life concrete policy solutions that were presented. And I ask in particular that the council members take up and, prote um, and pass protect. Thanks. Thank you. Next we have Jared Wilson. Good afternoon, my name is Jared Wilson. I'm the president of the San Diego Police Officers Association. There are many parts of this clearly biased study I find problematic, but I agree that our city should not depend so heavily on police when it comes to the mental health. That's why we support legislation like AB 1601, which will allow other first responders who are not police officers to write 5150 holds. This allows trained professionals to handle these calls and would free up officers to get more illegal guns and fentanyl off our streets. Meanwhile, a proposal put forth in the presentation is the PROTECT Act, which would abolish policing in San Diego. Public surveys show San Diegans want to see people held accountable for their crimes more often, not less. Residents, visitors, and small business owners are fed up with open-air drug markets, a rise in violent crime, and urban decay. They want more protection, not less. We are committed to working on policies that reduce interactions between the mentally ill and our police. Our officers and detectives are working hard to combat the drug crisis afflicting our homeless population with record high overdose tests. With the response times higher than ever, SDPD needs more resources, not less. We oppose the defund the police movement. We oppose the defund the police policies put forth here that this group promotes, and we need more support for high quality law enforcement in the city, not less. Thank you. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for the time. It's going to be a, a little good program uh, and be a good example for cities like LA. So I think, uh, Mr. Beekman, your connection's a little um, difficult to hear. There's a buzzing sound. I'm not sure if you have. Can you hear me better right now? No, there's better. just a continuous buzzing. I'm not sure if you have a TV or a now. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, let me try again. Can you start the timer over? Yes, we will restart the timer. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Very nice of you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, this is going to be a real nice item for our future, I think. Thank you. I think it's going to do some interesting work with what LA is dealing with right now and uh, different uh, ethnic and cultural groups trying to define the future of housing in LA. In LA. I think we're going to kind of go through the same thing and we can give some good examples, I think, with this uh, with this work. So thank you. Um, I, you know, the past week, there's you know, community meetings on the future of uh, surveillance technology that's going to be really focusing in low-income areas and in homeless areas. And, um, I, you know, I've learned important lessons about uh, we really can practice minimal practices of, of surveillance tech in these areas. So everyday people in those areas won't be surveilled as much. And we, there's ways to work on that. And I'll, you know, I'm good luck how we can be doing that. Um, I, oh, I had a few other things to say that uh, item, uh, a few words were mentioned about the future of leadership uh, for this sort of item uh, that I think can relate to the upcoming PAB surveillance things. And that I, I really hope that, um, uh, you know, city council and, and city government staff will work well together on these sort of projects. 
on the tech projects and housing projects. Uh, it, good connections, good communications, and then connecting with the public well. That's, we, I think we may have to rethink that as a group effort, and good luck. My apologies, thank you. The five minute timer also did expire, but we only have one more speaker in the queue, and that is Laurie Saldana. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. So I want to acknowledge all the previous speakers but one who showed up of their own time on their own dime and have been showing up for people unsheltered, doing the work that this council even today is refusing to take on. The cost to the taxpayers is immeasurable because you are refusing to direct resources to solve this problem. You are refusing to direct the police, even today, someone who is being paid to frankly spread misinformation spoke against this policy. I advocate or I support the researchers and applaud them for advocating action. Too many researchers simply remain objective and report without advocacy. Thank you to those who have, that, to the researchers today for not only speaking, but for telling the council clearly what needs to be done. Janice Wilds, thank you for showing up and being such a strong speaker. Michael McConnell, John Brady, so many people are giving their time and this council is being well paid to essentially do nothing but pass along the cost to pro bono attorneys like Colleen Cusack, who documents through an evidentiary hearing what we all know and see and you refuse to take action on. So as others have pointed out, it is your job to enforce this and it is your job to save lives. And if you're not taking action on this today, shame on you. Your time has expired and that does conclude public comment on this item. Uh, thank you, thank you, Interim Clerk. Um, thank you to members of the public who, um, who weighed in. Um, I've got a couple initial comments. We'll go to Council President Pro Tem, see if there's anyone else who'd like to uh, ask questions or make comments. Um, I just want to provide some context. Uh, I think the members of this council have made a point of, um, of, of wanting to emphasize racial equity um, in our work. We've also, um, a, a variety of us, um, or almost all of us, I think, have also talked about our desire to see the situation related to homelessness improve. I want to acknowledge that this is a deeply uncomfortable conversation. Um, and that's part of why I thought it was important for us to have the conversation here at council. Um, I also wanted to, to provide some context about what this is not. Um, the study itself was not, as I understood it, uh, not an examination of policing. Uh, I don't think you all set about to impugn um, San Diego p uh, police. Um, it should not have been, I, I hope it did not come across as uh, an opportunity to impugn any specific council member or this body as a whole. Uh, I'm gonna be honest, folks, this thing didn't just magically appear on the docket. Like it was, it was put here for a reason. Uh, I docketed it because I thought it was an important conversation. My colleagues here sat in their seats. They didn't have to all sit here. Um, we could have barely held on to, 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 um, to quorum. They're here, they're listening. We're here, we're listening because we do care. And so I will just encourage everyone, regardless of uh, what side of the debate you're on on these things, to not question the concern that folks have for people who are living, uh, who are experiencing homelessness in San Diego right now. It's not a productive way to have a conversation for me, and it will immediately make me extremely defensive of uh, my colleagues here, because I know they do care. Um, so I wanted to provide that additional, con or th that initial context um, I wanted to, to say thank you to, to the researchers for uh, presenting. Um, I thought this was an important report for us to hear as a body, um, for us to have a conversation about. Um, I will now turn to Council President Pro Tem um, and have some additional comments after that. But uh, Council President Pro Tem. Thank you, Council President. Uh, uh, thank you for docketing this. Um, appreciate your words. I want to thank Megan, Welsh Carroll, uh, Sean Flanagan, um, Nicholas Gutierrez um, for conducting this research and producing this report. The last time we had a report that focused on 
black homelessness. I almost had a breakdown on the diet, so I'm not going to do that today. Um, it is a very emotional topic in doing um, the work that I'm doing in reparations, understanding that this is a systemic issue that our country has been built on. It has been built on um, the labor of black people and the suppression of black people. And I think that approaching um, our work with that lens is very, very important because the system that we have come to known as, be known as normal um, is actually a system that oppresses um, black people in particular in order to survive. And so that is what we're seeing in report after report after report. I was just thinking about Michelle Alexander and I was thinking about all of the, the criminal legal system reform work that we're trying to do and how that is spilling over into homelessness and whether we should call this the new Jim Crow as well. Because the quotes that I see um, and the things that I've seen with my own eyes and um, it is just, it, 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 is, it, is, it is very overwhelming, but not too over overwhelming for us, of course, to, to do something about it and to do the work. So when I approach this work, it doesn't matter if I'm called uh, a person who is responsible for all of the violence in all of the parks across the city of San Diego. I've been, I've been um, accused of that. Um, I've been accused of us not having um, the staff that we need at the police department. I've been accused of that. Um, and in my mind, I'm going to continue to do this work because all we're asking is for folks to be fair. And as Martin Luther King said, all I'm asking is folks to be who they say they are on paper. That's it. And so I'm going to continue to do this work, and I appreciate research on top of research to support it. I would, I would ask community members to at least be encouraged that we will get somewhere or at least have protect or you know versions of um legislation legislation that tackles racial profiling this is a 400 year system and i say that because i also get a little frustrated um and I know we're not moving fast enough because everybody, including me, needs everything right now. But we have to constantly try to overcome what we have all been taught, what we have all been taught, and to do it in a way where we get buy-in. Because you know what? We could pass something, and we could turn it over, and guess what? It will not be implemented. So I just want to keep that, you know, in mind as we're we're doing this work. That you know, I, I just have to say that because it is an, an, an important piece of the puzzle. I have I feel an obligation to lead on this issue for many different reasons, but understanding that I am fighting against systems that have been built to do exactly what this system is doing to actually make our country work the way it's been working. And so I don't expect this change to happen overnight. But as long as I'm in a position of power, I'm going to push it. I'm going to push it. And anyway, I, I will leave it there. I um, mean, I will say that I appreciate the recommendations. Um, I am looking forward to merging these with the, the recommendations that we have from our ad hoc report and dedicating our time and resources to this issue. Um, I will let someone that participated in this survey to have the last word. Um, I am a lifeless, black, unimportant soul to them. I am a lifeless, black, unimportant soul to them. I pray that no person has to feel like that. I pray. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council President Pro Tem. Councilor Woodrum. Thank you, Council President, and thank you very much for bringing this item forward this afternoon. 
Uh, I want to thank the presenters for joining us today to share your perspectives on this. Uh, thank you to all of you who uh, took the time this afternoon to come in or join us online uh, to share your viewpoints during public comment. Uh, and thank you for the words and leadership of our Council President Pro Tem, uh, Montgomery Stepp. Uh, one of the points that you made during the PowerPoint presentation uh, was how important it is from a humanitarian perspective to address basic needs. Uh, you say, quote, recognize the human right to water, toilets, and trash disposal. Make public spaces safe and healthy while folks wait for permitted housing, unquote. We absolutely must prioritize that. In fact, I'll be bringing forward a safe sleeping initiative that is designed to do just that, a model that has worked well in other cities where typically you take a parking lot that is away from homes and businesses, screen it off for privacy, and provide security and bathrooms and food and water and connections to services and housing for people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. That is precisely the type of safe, healthy and stabilizing place we need for people experiencing homelessness. As the presenters mentioned, some people don't want to go into a congregate shelter. We need to be able to offer other options like safe sleeping. Because living on the sidewalks is unsafe. A year and a half ago, three people living on the sidewalk near City College were hit by a car and killed when it jumped the curb and ran into their encampment. People living on the sidewalks are routinely preyed upon by drug dealers or subjected to random attacks. We hear about that all too often. And people living on the sidewalks can be sickened by disease, as we've seen with the people we have lost to outbreaks of hepatitis and shigella. It is neither safe nor compassionate to have people sleeping on the streets. I'm pleased that this city council has made it a priority to have the primary outreach to our unsheltered population come from nonprofit outreach workers. In 2000, uh, or I'm sorry, in 2020, when you conducted this research, more of the initial outreach to unsheltered individuals was conducted by police officers. In the past two years, this city council has invested heavily in contracting with nonprofit outreach providers specifically to improve the important relationship between the unsheltered population and those who are offering services to them. And I want to second what the council president said. I am very appreciative of my colleagues on this city council who, in my view, have tried very hard to balance the many considerations involved in addressing these issues. In my view, it is important that we create safe, healthy, and stabilizing places for people experiencing homelessness, that we ensure that no one is left sleeping on the sidewalks, that we ensure unsheltered individuals are presented with options for shelter or safe sleeping locations from outreach workers they feel comfortable speaking with, and that unsheltered individuals are always treated with respect and dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Woodburn. Um, appreciate those comments. Um, I, um, I will we'll add a few comments here and have some questions as well. Um, one of the things that stood out to me about this and one of the reasons why I thought it was important to be heard was the origin for the study. Um, as mentioned, it was not a study of policing or race, uh, but the initial question around service utilization and survival strategies of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, and I, I thought that that origin was important. Um, the fact that pursuing that led to this, I think, is important. Um, one in that, to me, it, it, it demonstrates that there wasn't an intent to produce the report that you have here, um, but it seemed like an unavoidable truth that came from the, the research that was done. Uh, but I think it's also for, important for us um, as we think about the ways that we um, want to expand upon how we are addressing homelessness in San Diego. Councilor Whitburn, I appreciate you no noting some of the differences between 2020 and now. Um, it is not um, a stagnant effort. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's a perfect effort or that every step that this council has taken um, has been perfect. Um, but I do know that this uh, council in partnership with the mayor has significantly expanded shelter options and um, diversified the way that outreach is done. Again, clearly lots of work to be done, um, but um, we're here um, pursuing transparency, and I think that part is important to mention. Um, council President Pro Tem was uh, 
speaking to the, the multiple systems that are um, that, that lead us to where we're at um, and how long those systems have been in place, uh, this line um, stood out to me. Um, is in the section uh, titled Poverty Governance, Racialized Policing, and the Criminalization of Survival Strategies in the COVID-19 Era. It says, uh, black unhoused people live at the nexus of multiple systems of injustice and oppression. Black renters in San Diego, California are more rent burden burdened than anywhere else in the United States. And housing insecurity in black communities has been syst systematically cemented by public policy that redlines communities and stymies home ownership. The United States treats those in poverty as problems to be managed whose aid is dependent on appropriate behavior and whose behavior is constantly monitored for signs of deviance due to structural racism. Black, indigenous, and people of color communities are considered particularly at risk of deviance and in need of monitoring. I thought that was a really powerful paragraph for laying out how the system uh, has been designed and how it is working. Um, and in addressing the problems and some of the disparities that we see in this report, there's a multitude of, of ways that we can do that simply from analyzing this paragraph. For example, um, doing what we can to um, ensure that black renters in San Diego are not the most rent burdened of anywhere else in the, in the United States, um, and increasing home ownership opportunities um, in the black community. Um, I think these are actually some efforts that this, this council has aggressively pursued um, and has worked in partnership with, with the mayor to do. There's obviously other areas where, again, we have room for growth. Um, if I can ask the presenters to come up, I've got um, a couple questions for you. Uh, again, and this is, a, you know, I, I wanted you all to be here and present. We, we docketed this because I thought it was important to, to hear. And I also think that an exchange of ideas is important as well. I'll be honest. Um, so the recommendations are important. And I will also be honest, I don't know anyone who would look at San Francisco right now and say that is a, a better model for doing things. Um, there, and I say that as a progressive who has often cited San Francisco in the past as a place of, of, of where I'm inspired and, and interested in some of the policy ideas that come, there, uh, come from there. And outcomes should be the thing that we value most. And I don't know how we could look at the outcomes in San Francisco with respect to displacement or homelessness and say, that's a model. Um, that being said, I think there's other places that um, have made some, some positive progress. So I, I mention that because it's one thing to have, um, have things that are good in concept and other things that seem to be working in practice. And in some of the cities that are mentioned, um, I think we see an example of, of places where things are and are not working well. One of the tensions, that I, and I'll speak for myself here, um, that we struggle, that I struggle with, with respect to homelessness, is desperately wanting to improve the conditions for those who are on the street, uh, not um, layer on the, the levels of oppression and suppression that people who are experiencing homelessness are experiencing, recognizing the racial disparities that exist um, for those experiencing homelessness, and wrestling with the reality that people are not meant to sleep on the streets or in canyons or in parks, and there's real world impacts of people living in those places on not just those who are experiencing homelessness, but the community at large, health and safety impacts as an example. So um, I, I wanna detangle the criminalization of homelessness from the um, protection or prosecution of criminal activity around encampments for a moment. And I think we can all recognize that bad things do happen in and around encampments um, without saying that all, bad pe all, that all people in encampments are bad people. And so if, if you have any, um, anything that you glean from your research about addressing some of the criminal activity that has, been, that has targeted those who are experiencing homelessness and exists around encampments, um, both for the safety of those in encampments and the community at large, um, while not exacerbating the issues that we see here in terms of racial disparities. Um, yeah. So just to rephrase the question, um, so I'm clear about what you're asking. You would like us to situate our findings and recommendations within cr criminal activity that is happening at encampments? I'm, I'm asking if there is anything gleaned from the research to address the issues around encampments, right? So for example, I think we, um, I, I know that 
the homeless community is targeted um, in certain ways. So there is criminal activity that we can set aside anything around encampments or um, illegal lodging, anything like that, other sorts of criminal activity. So if kind of in the real world, addressing that, not those sort of criminal activities, right? Um, if, they shouldn't be crimes. That's fine, that's fine. Not even going back and forth to you about that. Setting that aside, the rest of it, how do we, how would you recommend that we address that? Was there anything gleaned from your research on that front? These are, and I'm, I'm bringing this up because this, these are the practical realities that we wrestle with as we think about addressing this problem in a way that doesn't compound the problems that we have and doesn't just continue to do the things that we've done in the past. I think your question is a good one and it makes a lot of sense and I think that, you know, we too live in our own neighborhoods and have people experiencing homelessness in our neighborhoods so we understand, you know, the basis of these kinds of questions that you're asking. Um, so I think to answer your question, our data don't ask crime questions so if you're asking us to say something directly from our data, that would be a difficult thing for us to do. If you're asking us to speak about possibilities from you know, Megan's expertise as a criminologist and my expertise in public affairs, that might be something that we might more be able to do and we would be happy to do that. Like for example, last week I was really fortunate to have a call with Omar, Omar Passons. I think a lot of you know him. He was very involved with homelessness here in the city of San Diego and is now the assistant city manager in the city of San Jose. And they're really doing a lot of experimenting with managed encampments and their public works goes around and does trash collection from the encampments and folks don't like to engage in criminal activity when city officials are coming by all the time right so even just offering more managed locations and safe locations for people megan's the criminologist she could speak to that more effectively probably deters criminal activity, right? You, if you have a bunch of porta potties that are managed maybe by city staff or one of these workforce development programs that was referenced earlier, let's have bathrooms so people are defecating in a bathroom or in a porta potty and not on the street and maybe let's do trash pickup from the encampments. We don't want an encampment on the corner, but housing isn't gonna fall out of the heavens for us, right? We all know that. So what are we gonna do in the interim while we're waiting for that housing? Those are things where, you know, if, if the city is coming by a couple times a week and staff are stopping by for this and here's the staff for the porta potties and these things, the criminal activity is going to dissipate or maybe move elsewhere, right? But not be in those, um, in those locations where you have people and lights and things around. You could probably speak to that more effectively as a criminologist, but that would be like an example, right? I think that one of the takeaways we would love to see from our suggestions are that a lot of the things that are good for um, addressing the, the survival needs of people experiencing homelessness on the streets are, are really good for the quality of life of the average San Diegan, right? If there isn't trash on the street, that's nicer for me when I'm walking out of the restaurant downtown that I wanted to go to. It's my husband's birthday today. I want to go out and have a nice meal with him in Hillcrest. I, I have a lot of compassion for people experiencing homelessness. I also don't really want to deal with the person having a schizophrenic episode. You know, I mean, you know, we, I don't want to step over feces on the sidewalk. I don't, it's not like I enjoy those things even though I have deep compassion for the people living in those situations, right? And so all of those things that help these individuals also increase the quality of life in our neighborhoods too. I really do think these things can be a win-win in our neighborhoods. Thank you, that, that's actually quite helpful. I appreciate that. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's well, I had an opportunity to see um, some of the trash collection services that, in San Jose that they were providing for one of the encampments and that did seem to make an impact on um, the health and safety of the folks in that encampment and the surrounding community. Um, so that recommendation was particularly intriguing to me. Um, I wanna say thank you again for producing the report, for presenting, I think this was really important. Um, the, the disparities around race um, in, in, with respect to, our, to unsheltered homeless San Diegans and people experiencing homelessness generally um, are amongst probably the most um, shameful numbers that, that and data points that we have as a society and as a city. And we need to wrestle with that. And um, recognizing um, what we are doing to exacerbate or perpetuate 
um, that I think is important to do. Again, I recognize that this is a, an uncomfortable conversation. I thought it was an important one for us to have here um, at council. Um, I'll go back to council president pro tem before we wrap up. I'm sorry, council president. Yeah, I, I, I just, I did have a lot of questions, which I'll reach out. Um, uh, I just kind of try to stay between in, in my time frame, but I do have a question about the conclusion and, um, a sentence, last sentence in the first paragraph, our framework does not show only a vicious cycle, but a cycle with an exit ramp where criminalized people's perspectives can be used to transform systems of justice and where subjects of poverty governance can have a voice in transforming social services. So um, I remember when we first established um, the department that um, is tasked with uh, dealing with our homelessness issues um, at the city of San Diego. This was in the prior administration. And I, w I advocated for a person with lived experience to actually be on the staff. So this is not just a board member, you know, or you know, you can volunteer on this board with while you're trying to get housing, um, or you can, you know, do these things, but not necessarily having folks within a system. One to understand how hard uh, it is to change the system, but also to bring lived experience um, to that conversation, so that where we can cut and be more efficient, um, we can be. But I wanted to know from you all. Uh, any, any ideas or other ways where, when we say that, where that voice can be utilized to transform those systems? That's such a great question. I, I wanna just off the top of my head, point back to the action plan, which I know you know inside and out around addressing homelessness amongst black San Diegans. That report has a set of comprehensive recommendations, including that inclusive procurement recommendation um, that we feel is just so critical to realigning our homeless serving systems to the needs of the people who actually are, are seeking services, right? And so when we say top to bottom and throughout these systems, folks of color and folks with lived experience of homelessness need to be those staff people that an unhoused person meets for the first time when they're walking into the door of your agency, all the way to the top leadership of these organizations. And so what I understand, I, I, this is a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but what I understand of the dynamics around homelessness service provision here in San Diego is that the smaller organizations, maybe the organizations that are led by people of color, are having real challenges and structural barriers to getting up and running and to getting those contracts so that they can provide those services. And so I, I would just kind of ask folks to sit with that action plan because I think the folks on that committee really did their work in thinking about that. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. So yeah, inclusive procurement, I think is super important. Um, that's the only question that I'll leave for right now. I know we'll be in touch with some of the other questions that I have, but just the last point is that it is that vicious cycle where if people do not feel like the system will work for them, they will continue to uh, deny those types of services, which result in what we see now. Um, not not talking about the housing issue, which is the most important thing, but um, the systemic issues really um, need to be addressed holistically. So thank you again. Thank you, Council President Pro Tem. I'll, I'll quickly note, Council President Pro Tem, Councilman LaCobb and I uh, issued a request um, a little while back for the housing commission items and items coming from the Homeless Strategies and Solutions Department to lay out how they've incorporated the recommendations of the ad hoc committee. So um, tomorrow we'll hear an item at Rules Committee uh, related to a, a um, safe parking at Rose Canyon. Uh, in that staff report, we'll make mention of how the recommendations of the ad hoc committee are being incorporated into that action item. Again, the Housing, housing Commission will be doing the same. That's, for, that's so that the, the, the council as a whole has an opportunity to see um, how uh, the commission and our homeless strategies and solutions department are incorporating those recommendations to each and every item that we hear here at council. Um, just again, to, to ensure that the work that was done there is honored 
and we know how it's being honored. Uh, Councilor Vlacaba. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, as you said, this was an uncomfortable conversation, and it was uh, uncomfortable for me to stay silent. Uh, I appreciate uh, the presentation and the research that you did, uh, the members of the public that called in and the frustration that you expressed and the comments of my colleagues uh, here. Um, a couple of, of questions I was hoping that maybe somebody else would bring up, and, and so I wanted to follow up. Um, uh, I think Councilmember Whitburn brought this up, and in fact, the conclusion of your report does mention the fact that your field study was done in 2020 and the world's different today. Um, Nobody should be proud of where we are today, uh, for certain, but how do we, as decision makers today, actually reflect on the fact that you had a different mayor, you had five different council members back in 2020, different operations, and whether there is any benefit or any progress in where things are today? Is that within your purview to comment on that? So your question is, have things improved since our study? Yes. Well, put it simply, yeah. In my opinion, they have not. Um, and this is not just opinion. It is rooted in data. So we presented one study to you here today. I have done many studies on this topic here in San Diego over the past eight years. and. What I see is a worsening of conditions on the street. I see less access to services, and we hear it from folks when we do interviews with people on the street, which we did last summer for another study related to public restrooms and the urgent need to have more public restrooms with expanded hours of operation and with basic services such as menstrual products and toilet paper. We want the basics. Right? And uh, we have seen no improvement in the provision of basic needs such as public restrooms on our city streets and especially in downtown San Diego where we know that we have a growing number of folks experiencing homelessness. I think the numbers just stabilized last month, but otherwise the downtown partnership had been documenting an increase in homelessness, invisible homelessness, right? And through our work on the Project for Sanitation Justice, we're trying to look at, well, are folks on the street able to access these basic services, these basic needs that we're talking about that will lift the quality of life, trash collection, public restrooms? And what we see, at least in the downtown neighborhood, is that the ratio of toilets to folks experiencing homelessness is well over one toilet to every 200 folks experiencing homelessness, and this doesn't include everyone else who needs those facilities, right? So I'm answering your big question with one small example of ways that it feels like conditions on the street are static or have not improved. Um, I think we heard that from folks in public comment who are out working with people on the street on a regular basis. People are desperate to be able to meet only their basic needs. Um, and since you mentioned COVID, I would say from the folks that I have spoken with, they have seen a deterioration and a reduction in access to services since COVID. Um, when we're talking about public restrooms, a lot of restrooms closed and were very slow to reopen with limited hours, limited services. And so I think we still have, we're still rebuilding out of this pandemic in that way, if that answers your question. You, you kind of got there. Uh, clearly when there's more individuals downtown and there's no addition of restrooms, the ratios are gonna go in absolutely the wrong way. Uh, clean SD. Uh, any thoughts about how Clean SD is meeting your your suggestion about trash collection? I have no comment on that. Do you? I'm not aware. Okay. Um, you titled your report "Homelessness." Did you speak to sheltered individuals and what their feelings are? Yes, our data set included folks staying in temporary shelters, including folks staying at the convention center shelter during COVID. Okay, and it was consistent across 
the, there was a consistency across the study and whether they were sheltered or actually, or living on the street. We spoke to members of both of those groups. Okay. And did you talk to the social service providers and the managers of the shelters? This was only a study to capture the views of unhoused people because we feel those views are the least represented um, when we're talking about health and human service policy. Okay, and I, I don't disagree, and, and that, that was the answer that I expected you to say, because I think that's the complexity of what we hear. Uh, we hear quite eloquently from Mr. Brady and others about what life is like in the shelters, so even if you offer to shelter, people don't want to go, which I equate differently than I don't want service. It's the services you offer um, don't meet even my, you know, an individual's minimum standards going forward. And I think to the um, uh, council president's point, we keep hearing about this. We never get any real answers in terms of the quality of the services in the shelters and what life is like in the shelters. Um, what we don't, what we do know is with the increasing numbers and in addition to the downtown partnership numbers, we have the RTFH, which is now for the first time actually tracking who is it being housed and we are housing people great news, and more people are becoming house, homeless for the first time. That isn't a matter of what's happening on the ground. That is more of the systemic problem that the council president the council president pro tem spoke to. So that's a different issue that we need to tackle in a different, uh, different way. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, not the fact of the matter, strike that, I don't know where that came from, but the challenge we have is the number of people that are becoming homeless faster the lack of social workers that actually can get out there, the funding that is year by year instead of uh, a, a, a consistent funding, sustainable funding that we can actually make plans for. Um, I think there's a lot of good things being done. It is not enough, as I think you all highlight in terms of what are doing. Um, and it is for us to have those uncomfortable conversations Board and what uh, what the city is going to do about it, um, and you know I'll, I'll I'll leave that there. Thank you for your study. Thank you for the members of the public um, for the thoughts that you shared and where we're falling short and where we need to do better. Uh, and what I would also like, and people hate it when I say this, you don't need to talk with us. You need to talk to the people out there. I'm not talking to you specifically, but the people out there that resist the efforts to bring in more restrooms, to provide safe camping, to provide affordable housing or income, uh, low income uh, housing, um, wraparound services housing. That's part of the challenge. That's not an excuse on our part, but that's kind of a reality of the challenge we face. Where can we find this? I know we're gonna bring a safe parking, not the greatest, but it's all we could find that actually meets the criteria, and it's, it's, it, it'll do for a few families, and I'm grateful for that. So the challenge goes on. We're, we're fighting a losing battle, and it's pe people that are paying the price for that, and we need to do better. So thank you for responding to my questions, and thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councilor LaCava. Uh, thank you again to, the, uh, to our presenters, and um, not just for presenting, but for the research that you did. Um, and for t tackling it the way you did, um, for being attuned to what rose up in that initial, um, from that initial question that you asked um, about, again, um, service util utilization. Um, I think, again, that, that's powerful, um, that a, a, a re research effort that started with that lens led to, to this product um, that's not lost on me. Um, I um, will just, again, I think because of what I heard in some of the comments, um, you know, Councilmember Moreno is championing um, an effort to increase home ownership uh, opportunities. Councilmember LaCava championed an effort to pro provide menstrual products in restrooms. Um, Councilmember Whitburn has spent the better part of a year trying to find a place um, where community won't um, revolt in his attempts to provide a safe place for people to camp. Um, Councilmember Campbell has taken on uh, multiple voices in opposition to shelter opportunities in her district. Um, Councilmember Campillo has joined efforts uh, to bring safe parking into his district, and Councilmember Von Wilpert has done quite a bit with respect to homelessness as well. Uh, this effort's not lost on us, and uh, me 
and, and I have no doubt, Councilman, no offense, Councilman Lee, you're, just, you're, you're the new one. Um, uh, get on it. Um, uh, um, but, you know, this isn't to say we're doing it right. I, nothing bothers me more when I leave this office and come here every day than seeing that our city hall, that the, the, the awnings of city hall are, are the only cover that people have um, for people at night and the racial disparities that you'd have to literally close your eyes or be blind in order not to see um, impact me profoundly. Um, so um, again, we're not doing well enough. Um, but we are taking action and we do, we do care. I, 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 I know that. Um, and so thank you again for the presentation and I hope that with this report um, we can do even better um, in partnership with the mayor. Thank you.